This, This is, is Father Jude, Jude and, and I would, would like, like to discuss, discuss with you ministries in the Catholic, Catholic Church. Church. We, We start, start with this picture. This, this picture, picture is the Pentecost when, when Mary and the Apostles received the Holy Spirit. Remember, before Jesus died, He told His disciples that He will ask the Father, God the Father, to send the paraclete or the Holy Spirit in His name. And the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. This event is a very significant event to the Church because this is when the Church received the gift that is the Holy Spirit. It was promised by Jesus and that promise was fulfilled during Pentecost. So the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were filled with courage. Remember, they were so afraid when Jesus was crucified. Remember that Peter denied Jesus three times for fear that he too might be handed over to be crucified. The disciples ran away. Two of them actually ran as far as Emmaus. They hid themselves, they fled for fear that they too will be killed. But during Pentecost, they were filled with courage to spread the good news. They went out and preached courageously. Now the disciples therefore went out to preach following the command of Jesus, uh, which is stipulated in Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20. Uh, they were following the command of Jesus that they go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they spread the good news, not anymore afraid, but courageous and willing to die for their faith in Christ. In fact, All of them, all the apostles, died for their faith. They were all martyred because of their faith in Christ, except, of course, St. John the Beloved, who died of old age. But just the same, even St. John lived and shared the faith in Christ. Now, as members of the Church, we are also given that same mission, to make disciples of all nations, to share the faith, to share Christ to others. We are also given that same mission by virtue of our baptism. We are also given the same mission and we also received the, the same Holy Spirit to stand with courage and share Jesus to all. And this is the purpose of founding the Catholic Church. So that the mission of Christ, the mission that Christ himself started, may be continued even until today. And that is our mission. We all share in this mission of spreading or sharing Jesus to all the world. We are all partakers, as it were, in this mission of sharing Jesus to others. And this is articulated in CFC 1412 which says that Christ founded his church to continue his saving mission on earth. And we continue this mission of Christ wherever we are, whatever we do, whatever is our profession, whatever is our status in life, we are sharing in this mission that Christ has given to the church. Basically, we are sharers in this mission. We have a role to play as members of the church founded by Jesus Christ. We continue this mission in different walks of life. We therefore continue this mission in different ministries. Now, what is ministry? Generally, ministry means service or Christian ministry service to the people of God in an orderly fashion. Let us take a look at uh, CFC 1420. What is ministry? 
Ministry includes any public activity of a baptized disciple of Christ animated by the grace or charism of the Holy Spirit, performed on behalf of the Christian community and in the service of the kingdom of God. So ministry includes any public activity of each member of the church. Such activities are animated, as it were, by the grace or charism of the Holy Spirit. Meaning, each ministry is a gift from God Himself. It is grace given to each member of the church, so that in the church we have different ministries. If you notice, not all of us are choir members. Because, obviously, not all of us can sing or can sing well. Some of us are readers, some of us are collectors, some of us serve as leaders, some of us serve as uh, servers, etc., etc. So our ministry depends on the grace, depends on the charism that we receive from God. So again, we look into 1420 of the CFC. Ministry includes any public activity, meaning activities done in public or for the people, uh, activities of a baptized disciple of Christ, animated by the grace or charism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, such ministry or are actions animated by the grace of God, by the grace of the Holy Spirit of God, performed on behalf of the Christian community. So we summarize, what is ministry? Letter A, it is doing something or any activity. Letter B, done for the kingdom of God, meaning for the people of God. Letter C, done in public, meaning for the people, for the church. Letter D, by a baptized disciple of Christ. And such ministry or such actions are animated by grace or animated by the Holy Spirit. So ministry is, in the first place, a gift from God given to each member of the church who performs this for the benefit of of the kingdom of God. And we should remember always that such activity, okay, such activity for the people of God is animated by grace or the cause of such activity is the Holy Spirit Himself. Now, so that ministry is not something that is reserved only for a few. It is not reserved only for priests or nuns. Ministry is a gift for all baptized Christians. As I said earlier that all of us share in this ministry in the continuing, in the continuation of the mission of Christ. All of us being baptized are sharers in this mission so that ministry is not reserved only to the religious, not only reserved to the priests or the nuns, but Ministry is an activity animated by grace by all the baptized Christians. Meaning, we all have a share in the ministries of the church. It is actually a vocation of all members. The grace or charism comes from God, given to the baptized as a gift to be shared to the church. Now, we look at this uh, uh, slide. Ministry, in its most general sense, is not the privilege of a selected few, but the vocation of all baptized. Meaning, each one of us received that same gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, our activities for the people of God are animated by the Holy Spirit Himself. Now, there are two main ministries in the church. In general, we have the ordained ministry. Second, the ministry of the laity, which includes the marriage state and the religious life. Okay, so we will discuss this in generic terms, meaning 
uh, ministries in the church can be divided in, in two, ordained and then the laity. All right? Now, that's me. This picture was taken during my ordination to the priesthood on April 26, 2007. I was ordained by Cardinal Quevedo in uh, San Carlos Borromeo Parish in Isulan, Sultan, Kudarat. Now, this ministry, uh, ordained ministry, is one of service for the church, serving the people of God, serving in persona Christi, serving in the person of Christ. CFC 14.22 tells us that these ministers receive the authority and power to serve the church acting in the person of Christ. In persona Christi, meaning Christ being the head, but they are fundamentally ordered to serve, okay, to the service of the entire people of God. So the ordained ministry is service for the people of God, okay, they are serving in the person of Christ or in persona Christi, meaning they are doing the ministry in the person of Christ. Again, it is always and fundamentally ordered to serve the people of God. Now, to be serving in persona Christi is such a big responsibility. Imagine you are serving the people of God in persona Christi. That is a huge responsibility, a huge gift from God, a huge gift with a huge responsibility now <clears throat> so we may ask how can one act in persona christi okay so that is our question paano or how can one person or how can one priest act in persona christi the answer is through christ himself in the unity of the holy spirit all right, so in CFC 1.4.22, it states that these ministers receive the authority and power to serve the church acting in persona Christi, the head, but they are fundamentally directed or ordered to the service of the people of God. So that, okay, so that uh, how can one act in the person of Christ or in persona Christi if not Christ himself, no? through Christ himself, in union with Christ's spirit. Because it would be too assuming, okay? Too assuming and too proud of a person to claim that he is acting in persona Christi. Who are you to say that you are acting in the person of Christ? It is too assuming and it is too proud of that person to be claiming that. Because it is... Uh, in, in fact, fact okay, it, it is, is only, only through Christ that, that one priest or that a priest can act in the person of Christ. If it is not given by Christ himself, okay, that, that person is too assuming or too proud to say that he is indeed acting in the person of Christ, when in fact, in the first place, such a responsibility was not given to him by Christ himself. So, Again, the ordained ministry is service for the people of God. It is not uh, for selfish intentions that the priest is ordained as a priest. He is ordained precisely because he is and should be ready to serve the church, the people of God. At times or sometimes, we look highly at our priests as if they are on a throne as if they are on a pedestal. We treat them like uh, a pop star. I remember uh, one parish during the anniversary of their parish priest. They asked their priest to sit on a throne, literally. They asked uh, their parish priest to sit on a chair, which is actually a throne. And they started giving him gifts. For me personally, the priest looked uh, ridiculous. He was, he was like a king being offered with gifts. So there are times that we, we do this. There are times that we, we look at our priests, we treat them like a pop star, 
uh, we, we treat them as if they have a throne, as if they are on a pedestal. We look highly at them. Now, we need to remember that the priests were ordained for the service of the church. They are ordained in order to serve the people of God, not to be treated like a king or a prince. That is why we also need to remind our priests. We need to remind them, Father, you are ordained to serve, not to be served. And I think that is not uh, uh, that is a good reminder for all priests uh, that uh, the laity, the, those who are not ordained, may actually remind their priests. Okay, uh, Father, you are you should be acting in the person of Christ because you are actually ordained for the service of the people of, of God. So again, it's a good reminder for all of us. <coughs> As uh, lay persons, we should not treat our priests uh, as if they are uh, on a pedestal, as if they are a pop star. We have to treat them and we have to understand that their huge responsibility is first of all service for the church. There are three degrees of uh, service of the ordained. The ordained ministry is divided into three. First, we have the bishop, second, we have the priest, and third, we have the deacons. These divisions are actually three degrees, no? as stated in the, in the monitor, in the slide. These divisions are three degrees of service for the church. Now, <clears throat> I said the priests were ordained for service. Priests were ordained to serve the people of God because what is their life as priests? What is their priesthood if not for the people of God? And this tells us how important are the lay faithful in the church. While we look highly at our priests, we should not forget that their priesthood will have meaning only when they are serving the people of God. So the importance of the lay faithful, the importance of the lay ministry. On the slide, we, we ask the question, what is the use of their priesthood without the people of God? What are priests for if there is no church, if there, is no, um, if there are no people of God as a square? Okay, so that their priesthood, okay, their priesthood, is meaningful because there is a church because there is the people of God whom they are to first of all to serve all right now <clears throat> cardinal henry newman is correct in saying that the church would look rather ridiculous without the laity the priest would be so alone by himself if there are no people to serve and what is the meaning of priesthood what will be the meaning of priesthood if there are no people to serve if the priestly ministry or the ordained ministry is for service of the people of god what is the meaning of the ministry if there are no people of god if there are no people to serve what would that life be without anybody in the church Priesthood is therefore enriched by the lay faithful. The meaning of priesthood is enriched by God in the church, okay, the people of God. All right, so that's about the ordained ministry. The ordained ministry is actually a gift from God, a huge responsibility, and such responsibility entails, first of all, service, uh, service, uh, for, for the, the people, people of God, God because your, your priesthood or one's priesthood will have meaning only if he is ordered to serve the people of God. God. So, so now we talk about the ministry of the laity or the lay faithful. All right, that's the ministry of the lay faithful. Um, the lay faithful, the people of God, which is the church. All right. Oops. Okay, okay, so we we'll transfer, transfer that. that. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> the basis of this ministry 
is the ground is grounded on the fact that we are all children of God and we are called by God to be holy and that is our vocation the ministry is founded on the basic calling of its Christian to be holy this call to be holy is not reserved to the priests or to the monks okay this call this vocation is for everyone for all the baptized for all the children of god and such calling to be holy is also a calling to continue the mission of jesus christ <clears throat> now <clears throat> a little bit of information about the laity before vatican ii on your monitor you see pre-vatican ii notions about the laity before Vatican II, the laity is looked down, as it were, as if they are second-class citizens of the church. First, there are the priests, okay, as I said, priests on the pedestal, okay, priests as uh, number one citizen or number one uh, first-class citizens of the church. So, before Vatican II, uh, the lay faithful, okay, the laity, are called the rest. Okay, again, first are the priests, meaning the ordained ministers, and then the rest, meaning the lay faithful, referring, of course, to the laity. They are also called the lay faithful, meaning the congregation. And they are most, they are most of the time seen as uh, audience in the church. They are merely seen as followers, before Vatican II, they, they have, have no active roles, roles in, in the church, meaning everything is bound to the priests. We, of we course, course, remember, okay, uh, if, if you look, look at this uh, picture, we remember the division. No? This division this is actually a division between the ordained and the laity. Okay, this, um, uh, how do you say it? This division, okay, these concrete walls, as it were. Only those ordained are allowed in the altar, and nobody is to cross the boundary. The laity is only to look from their seats, okay, far from the altar. They are merely audience to what is happening in the altar. Okay, these yellow arrows, okay. Uh, there is a gate, right? Gate dividing the ordained ministers and the lay faithful okay now <clears throat> even during communion you see this uh, you see this picture here okay wait a minute okay you see this division here all right you see this division everyone kneeling down to receive communion but this is a literal division between or among the ordained ministers okay these are the ordained ministers and those who are the lay faithful, meaning uh, you are only allowed, as it were, up to this point. You cannot cross that literal boundary. Okay? So, <clears throat> thanks to Vatican II, okay, that was the idea no? uh, during Vatican II or pre Vatican II, before the Vatican II, the lay faithful are called uh, the rest. Right, the lay faithful, the congregation, audience in the church, they are mere followers in the church. Okay, but after Vatican II, okay, we look at the lay ministers or the lay ministry, the lay faithful, as also those who are sent on mission. They are no longer audiences, okay, they are no longer spectators. They are also sent on mission. They are also missionaries. They are the new evangelizers. In fact, okay, meaning they have a rightful place in the church. Again, thanks to Vatican II because our view and understanding of the lay ministry has changed for the good, if not for the best. The laity are not any more audience. They, are, they now have active roles in the church and, and they are also sent on the mission, mission, not just the priests, not just the nuns, or not just the monks. All of them, all of us, including the lay faithful, are sent on a mission. 
We are, they are now the new evangelizers, the laity therefore have a rightful place in the church. PCP2 or the Plenary Council of the Philippines or the Second Council of Plenary Council of the Philippines also taught that the laity are sent to the world. They are sent on mission and their mission is to spread the good news in the vast and complex world. And such complex world Okay, it refers to uh, the, the world, world of education, the world of politics, society, economics, culture, sciences, arts, international life, and even mass media. So that through Vatican II, therefore, the Church confesses, uh, the church confesses her need for all the lay faithful. That the lay faithful, okay, is really necessary and really very important in terms of uh, in terms of sharing Jesus to others, because it is the lay faithful, okay, who goes to the world as it were, to the to the world of education, which we mentioned earlier, politics, society, economics, etc., etc. The church, okay, confesses her need for all the lay faithful, rich and poor, with a special gift, individual and collective, of farmers, fishermen, mass media practitioners, educators, civil servants, and professionals in the various strata of society. I remember my one and a half years in uh, President Quirino Parish. These are my uh, lay ministers, okay, uh, the ministers of the Eucharist. They are all dedicated ministers of the church in President Quirino. These women also take big responsibilities in the parish church. In the parish, not only the priest is the, the important person there. Okay, everybody is important, even these women, as I said, take big responsibilities in the parish church. They serve as lectors, music ministers, community leaders, and even serve, uh, serving at the altar. Okay? So that, <clears throat> speaking about the vastness of the roles that the laity take, the laity are the ones who go to the world every after Mass. If you look at, if you look at our situation, the priest after the Mass goes back to his convent. But the rest of the congregation, the lay faithful, go back to the world. They are the ones who are in the world, in the world of the marketplace, the hospitals, the schools, and families, and communities. Meaning, uh, the lay faithful are therefore the actual evangelizers of the world. Considering the number of priests, they can preach only in the church, they can evangelize as it were only during the celebration of the Eucharist, for example, during their homily, during prayer, etc., etc. But the lay faithful are the actual evangelizers of the world because every after Mass, wherever they go, they go to their families, they go to the marketplaces, they go to their communities, wherever they go, they bring with them Jesus. They are the true evangelizers along with their priests. So that after Mass, the priest says, the Mass is ended, let us go in peace. But strictly speaking, we do not end the Mass because we are commissioned by Christ through the priest to take with us the Eucharist wherever we go. So we continue celebrating by sharing Christ to others wherever we may go right after attending the Mass. All right, so the question is, the invitation for us, for the lay faithful, we bring Jesus to others, all right? We bring Jesus to others wherever we go, right after Mass, we go back to our homes, we go back to our communities, we go back to where we are, to where we work, so that the invitation is to bring Jesus with us, we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, and we bring Jesus wherever we go. But how can we bring Jesus, okay? How can we share Christ 
if we do not receive Christ as often as we should. We fail in this aspect because what can we share if we have not received Christ? And we can only receive Christ through the Eucharist. Now, we fail as Christians because we often forget. So the problem with us is forgetfulness. Remember, we were given by God everything. God created everything for us since day one. God provided for us. Six days, God provides for us. God gives us what we need. One week of blessings, all right? And on Sundays, we forget. Six days of enjoying God's blessings, and we forget to thank Him on a Sunday. Six days of blessings, one hour of service only, one hour of celebration of the Eucharist, and we are absent because we forget, or we choose to forget. Also, talking about uh, forgetfulness, couples no, promised their I do's during matrimony. An occasion they specially prepared for, and they easily forget, and then some of them separate. Also, the young people, they said yes to their parents not to succumb to premarital sex, but they easily forget. That is why today we have children and parents, they call it, so young to take responsibility of parenting. Now, this slide is actually very alarming because in the Philippines there are many teenage parents due to teenage pregnancies. Very alarming for us because we are number one in the ASEAN region in terms of teenage pregnancy. And this is something we could not, uh, this is something that we could not be proud about as Filipinos. Imagine we are number one in terms of teenage pregnancy. And this is very alarming because the number is increasing. In 2019, for example, one in 10 Filipino women who are aged 15 to 19 are already pregnant. That is really very alarming. Teenagers are being pregnant. Okay? So our sin is forgetfulness. We forget that we are loved. We forget that we are loved by God. We are loved by our parents. We are loved by our friends. We are loved by our neighbors. We easily forget that. So that remembering is the key to avoiding this sin of forgetfulness. Because our sin is uh, forgetfulness. Okay, so the remedy is remembering. All right? We have to remember. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Remember to honor your, your parents. Remember your promises. Remember to love. So, this is the same in our ministries. Ordained or laity, ordained ministry or the, the, the lay ministry, we all often forget. All of us forget. Even priests forget. Even the laity forget. So that there is a need to remember. All right? And remembering is to manifest our love for God and being faithful to our ministry as priests and lay faithful. And we should also remember, we should also remember that even if we are uh, forgetful, we have to remember that we have a God who always remembers. No, if we can add this one, uh, if we can add, if we can add that uh, we are a forgetful people. People, okay, we are forgetful people. But we have a God, we have a God, or our, but our God, okay, but our God is a God who always remembers. And this is what we need to thank God for, no? We are forgetful, okay, we forget our promises. We forget our obligations. We forget about um, our responsibilities. Again, we are so blessed for six days. And we easily forget that we are loved by God because He showered us with all the blessings that we need. 
and, and we, we forget. forget. But, but again, again, we are, are thankful that, that our God remembers. God, our God, is a merciful God. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you learned something from this presentation. For questions, you may write down your comments. Okay, you may write down in the comment section for your uh, clarifications. Maybe uh, some points that we can discuss in the next video lectures. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. God, God bless, bless you all. all.